Dr. Jessie Fields is a physician and she's on the faculty at Mount Sinai. She is a community health advocate for Committee for Independent Community Action. Please let's welcome Dr. Jessie Fields. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I, I'm really thrilled to be here. I want to first thank the Upper East Side organization and Sandre and Christina for inviting me. Thank you all for being here and for rallying and marching in support of Black Lives, in support of the Black Lives Matter movement, and for Black Lives every day. I would like to tell you, thank you, I would like to tell you how it has happened that I, as a black woman and as a doctor, come to be here today. And my journey from growing up poor in the black community of South Philadelphia and living as a child in the rooms above a soul food restaurant, a restaurant that was very much tied to and part of the inner city sub economy, the underground economy of drugs, crime, and prostitution. Being a doctor for me was motivated by a desire to make a difference, to help the black community, to help people in the poor community, to help people who were excluded, isolated, and at the social and economic bottom of society. I know about social exclusion, economic deprivation, and poverty from having been there at that bottom as a child. And it's always been very palpable to me that health is determined and shaped by the conditions in which people live, by the environment, by a person's economic status, by their economic opportunities, by their education, that all these social factors shape health, physical and emotional health. And of course, physical and emotional health are closely tied. I've worked as a primary care physician in Harlem for three decades, starting in East Harlem in the 1990s and since the, for the last 20 years in Central Harlem, a bit uptown, a bit further uptown from here. So what we're doing today, what we're doing here has everything to do with health. The Black Lives Matter movement has everything to do with health. The community has to be involved in shaping its health, including mental health. And that can be done with caring, helping people who have a strong commitment to community empowerment. Health and activism are closely related. Activism has always been essential to advancing health. The very idea that health care is a right came out of the civil rights movement, as did protests against segregation in medicine, which is still an issue. And certainly I understand, as an African-American physician, that if it hadn't been for such activism, for the civil rights movement, for people standing up, that I would never have had an opportunity to be a doctor in the first place. Other examples of the importance of activism in health are the women's movement, the silence equals death response of the refusal to remain silent in the face of the AIDS crisis. And today, health workers demonstrating for black lives. These advances would not have happened without grassroots communities rising up and protesting and the, act, the, the militant activism. The widespread racial disparities in health have been, as we all know, very dramatically exposed by the coronavirus pandemic. By the disproportionate numbers of people in communities of color who have suffered from infection and death from coronavirus, from COVID-19. Black, Latinx, Native American, and poor people face higher infection and death rates from COVID-19. But let me tell you, the entire history of this country for the entire history of this country, segregation, discrimination, 
and poverty have produced disproportionately high rates of sickness and death among African Americans. So this is nothing new. Unfortunately, and it means we have to raise our level of activism. The widespread health disparities here in New York and across the country are not because of biological differences, but because of structural racism, because of the racial caste system. These disparities are because of the racial caste system in the United States. Redlining, discrimination, the siting of toxic refineries in black neighborhoods, with the residents of these neighborhoods breathing toxins that cause cancer and asthma, and children exposed to lead, and people living in food deserts, are just some of the devastating health impacts of structural racism. Frontline workers are majority people of color. Home health aides, bus drivers, subway workers, and other transit workers, hospital staff, and sanitation workers, and they cannot work from home. Our concern must extend to all. Our concern must extend to all with activism for structural transformation to dismantle the root cause of inequality. We have to dismantle those structural inequalities. People living in public housing are at increased health risk, not only because of the pandemic, but due to the decades of disinvestment and neglect of public housing that have worsened living conditions and led to toxic building conditions with mold causing health problems and asthma. Many public housing developments are cited next to polluting industries. This environmental racism causes cancer and puts residents at seriously increased risk of COVID-19 related hospitalization and death. The lungs are particularly vulnerable to toxins and to infection. The cry, I can't breathe, is so often the cry of people at the bottom of the racist hierarchy, under the weight of police violence or of, of overwhelming illness such as respiratory complications of COVID-19. We live within a caste system and the poor and people of color are at the bottom of that caste system. But it is a whole system and everyone has to work to dismantle that system. Activist Sandrea Coleman with the Holmes Isaac Coalition is demanding that NYCHA, yes, thank you for your leadership, Sandrea. Sandrea and the, Colm, the Holmes Isaac Coalition is demanding that NYCHA repair these developments now. And I strongly support this demand and we should all strongly support public housing residents and their demands and their needs. The residents of public housing have been fighting to make public housing decent for the residents and their families who live there. They stand against the plans to turn public housing over to private developers and privatize it. This is the plan of our mayor, Mayor de Blasio, and we have been fighting against this. I work with the Committee for Independent Community Action founded 10 years ago by Dr. Lenore Fulani. The Committee for Independent Community Action, CICA. It's a community organizing initiative and a leadership training initiative that helps community people to advocate on behalf of the city's poor and that has been organizing in opposition to the privatization of public housing. And as I said, this privatization is the policy of the de Blasio administration. We know that police violence disproportionately kills people of color. We all witnessed police officers killing, kneeling on the necks of black Americans. Black men in America 
are up to three and a half times more likely than whites to be killed by law enforcement. We cannot breathe. The cry, I can't breathe, is repeated. The words, I can't breathe, are a primal cry for help. How does a doctor hear the words, I can't breathe? How does a nurse hear the words, I can't breathe? How does a human being hear the words, I can't breathe? What is the response of a doctor? What is the role of a doctor? What is the role and response of a doctor? Whose sister, in fact, is sick with emphysema, as my sister is. What is the role of a human being? What is the response of a human being to the cry, I can't breathe? The response is, or should be, to help the person, to help the person live, not to abandon them, not to kill them. The health of our people, of all of our people, should be at the very center of our democracy, as the heart of American democracy, with power in the hands of we the people, not in the hands of the politicians, not in the hands of the political parties, but in the hands of we the people. We the people are the power of democracy. But, but, it is not we the people who run the elections. It is not we the people who control or run the political process. And that has to change. Historic moments of possibility, such as we are in right now. We are right at this moment in a historic moment of possibility, where we could really make structural changes. But these kinds of moments have again and again been co-opted and sidetracked by political parties taking over the movement or shaping the goals of the movement into already existing structures when it is those very structures that are the problem. It is transformation. It is transformation not fitting into what already exists that we want. That is what, that is what the Black Lives Matter movement is all about. In one of his last essays, Dr. King wrote, the Black Revolution is forcing America to face all of its interrelated flaws racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism. It is exposing evils that are rooted deeply in the whole structure of our society. It reveals systemic rather than superficial flaws and suggests that radical reconstruction of society itself is the real issue to be faced. I am an independent. I am not a Democrat or a Republican. I am registered to vote as an independent, but I cannot vote in the primaries. Along with millions of other independents across this country, 3.5 million here in New York State, we do not have voting rights in the primaries because, they, because we choose not to join a political party. There are a million independent voters in New York City, and a majority of them are young people and people of color and we cannot vote in the primaries, and that is wrong. Along, along with all forms of voter suppression, it must be changed. Our democracy must be opened up. Voting rights must be expanded, not restricted. We can't breathe. We can't breathe. And the cry, I can't breathe, is repeated again and again. The history of black people in America is one of pain and of dying and of fighting to live and fighting for freedom. And that continues today. Eric Garner said, I can't breathe. George Floyd said, I can't breathe. Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Rashard Brooks, Eleanor Bumpers, say their names, say their names, say their names. So 
so many, and so many, many whose names we do not know are gone. Over the past 400 years, millions have gone. But we are here. We are here. We still breathe. We still walk on the ground. We will continue to march on the ground. This is all of our history. And we will continue on marching. We will continue on marching for freedom and justice. We have this chance now to turn history in a new direction. Let us not lose this moment. Let us not lose this moment. Let's take it for every inch we can take it to. Keep building the movement. Keep building the movement. Let us continue further and further for all those who have gone and for all who follow. Let us continue onward. Thank you.